Here we go. Thank you for joining the Reverend Dr. Sean Michael Greener, radio host, national pastor, author, and speaker for Sundays with Dr. Sean. Hold on tight. Here comes the truth. Can't control the studio audience. I'm sorry to tell you, we've decided to have an hour of just talking, just catching up. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Great to have everybody back, back from Texas. Good to have you. We've sure missed you. I missed you guys. Yeah, we we did, and and uh, we've got people from all over Pennsylvania, Delaware, all kinds of places. But we want to offer a special uh, welcome to uh, Mary, Mary Beth. You're just a blessing to have here, and we always look forward when you can join us. I don't know how she can ever find the time because she's just all over the world ministering to people. Now, this is a person whose whole life is dedicated to blessing and ministering to people. Absolutely amazing. So we're blessed to have you here. It's awesome. We want to thank the Stabley's for having us. First time back in a long time. And boy, I'll tell you what, I miss these people. Uh-huh. Miss these people. Front of the room to the back of the room. It's just great to have. Um, Gloria, you win again for oldest. There is no prize. I tell you what, you can have some ice cream cake, which thankfully the second oldest, the second oldest brought the ice cream cake. Priorities, that's what I've learned. Priorities. Well, they, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. And then, uh, and then, so it's so good to have everybody here. It's just wonderful. It's uh, thank you to the McLarens for coming. I know you had a, a stocked, busy day. And uh, did you win today? Did you win? We actually go to a car show today. We went to uh, car cruise with the club. Oh, car cruise. Yeah, those are fun. Those are fun. And thank you to our audience. What was that? Oh, oh, awesome, awesome. So uh, welcome to Bonnie and Antonio and uh, Dawn and Jennifer, uh, Jen the American Girl. We're so happy to have you. And We've got uh, Arizona represented, we've got Ohio, we've got California. Believe it or not, there are conservative people of faith in California. They're more than you'd ever realize. And we're glad to have you, uh, absolutely. And so the, the name of this uh, message is going to be The Old Truth, The New Understanding. It's derived from my book, um, which is at the editors now. And so we're super excited about that. It must be uh, worse than they thought it was because they've had it longer than they thought. So... Who knows, they might just send me back a bunch of red lines and say, you need to go back to the drawing board. But we'll see. Hey, welcome. Stormy Tucson. Y'all need the rain. So, And Miss Linda Cahalan, thank you for joining us. God bless you. Chris is on my mind every single day. And so we want to um, we want to do a little bit of a shout-out uh, today for those in the path of Dorian, the hurricane. It uh, really is something. It really slammed into the Bahamas at 220 miles per hour, one of the biggest recorded ever, and it's causing massive, massive damage. Um, We want to also, uh, Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, to all you folks there, we uh, are praying for everyone up and down the coast. To Florida, we have friends that are kind of hunkering down now. We've got other friends uh, all the way up the coast that are that are uh, really, really preparing and There's already some shortages of fuel and food and all of that. But by all accounts, this is going to be, unless it takes a miraculous turn out to sea, we're really in for it at the level of, they tell me, at the level of Florence. So my hat today, you might say, well, what in the world are you wearing a hat? A, I have a terrible, there you go, you can see it. Uh, But this says Topsail, and this is in North Carolina. It's my favorite place in North Carolina. Hey, Mr. Neal, thank you for cleaning up trash. She She gets a whole group together in her... I don't know. There's a name for it that she does. I think they call themselves the Trashy Girls. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but they have a marina there, and they but they go through the town, and they pick up trash. And you have a, it's a contest. I don't know what you win, but you win something. And they have a contest to pick up trash. It's what is it? Trash bags. Trash bags. You win all the trash bags you have. So, uh, but it's awesome that they do that. And and. And what's cool is, I think today, I was following a little bit, what's cool is they got the least amount of trash I think they probably ever have. It's it's awesome. Hello to Mark. Mark, if you need a custom knife. This is an ice cream cake. An ice cream cake with the storm. Being sold by Publix in Florida. Let me show this. Publix does not pay me to do this, but. It's 
Yes. Look at that. It's an ice cream it's cake. decorated like a hurricane. Like a hurricane I coming to hit Florida. Oh, Publix, a, a, a grocery store. One of my favorites. Let me tell you, I'm so into it. But Mark makes great knives. I think you're still doing that. And Ralph Force, so good to have you. So many great people joining us. I want to take a minute and uh, and we want to think about, put this name um, in your, your memory bank and your prayer bank. Uh, Marty, Miss Marty, follows the show, M-A-R-T-I. Um, she follows me and, and the stuff we do and is a great supporter and encourager. Well, she's in the hospital and she's very, very sick. Uh, um, it has to do with her left eye. It's cellulitis, but she has it in her eye. And we have a doctor in the house and you can probably validate that's, that's really serious. So she's a dear, dear lady. Then um, uh, Miss Catherine Wellborn lost her husband, Paul. Uh, she's a wonderful, elegant lady, uh, husband of many, many years. And uh, just they were a team where you saw the one, you saw the other. And, and so she's having to deal with that, the adjustment there. He just, just was buried, um, by all accounts, one of the most beautiful funerals ever. And uh, hi, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. So many of you joining us from all over. And, but uh, we want to pray for Miss Marty. And, and um, really, it's, it's a scary thing, scary, scary thing to be in the hospital like that. There's so many people that uh, are in a great struggle. And, you know, as believers, a community of believers, we, we reach out together and, and we say, well, you know, we'll pray for you. Now, everybody knows my saying, uh, don't say it if you don't mean it, if you're not going to do it. And it was ironic because our dear friends, you guys, friends of the show, and, and he's spoken here, uh, Jerry uh, Mitchell and Myra Mitchell, dear, dear friends. Um, hey, Peter, good to have you. Stephen, thank you for your service the fire service he just stepped down today after uh, almost two decades of service to the fire service he's a trauma i think he's a trauma nurse and 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 does so much so many other things that he just couldn't keep all those balls in the air so now he's kind of focusing so thank you for your service anyhow um the the interesting thing is is we went to a movie called the overcomer the overcomer movie have how many of you in the audience have seen it now be honest did you boohoo Oh, man, oh, man. I boohooed hardcore. I mean to tell you, I didn't even mess around with the tissues. I went straight for the premium, uh, not even, the, they're not even napkins. They're, they're really good stuff and good thing because, wow, it ripped me up. But, but there was a part in the movie where they talked about don't say you're, you're going to pray for somebody if you're not going to. Just to be honest and say, you know what, I'm not going to remember that. And that's a big thing with me. Don't don't say you're going to pray for me if you're not going to pray for me. And, and it falls back on me as well. Don't I'm not going to tell somebody I'm going to pray for them if I'm not going to pray for them. Uh, I just think it's a powerful, powerful thing. Anyhow, that was interesting in the movie for that to have been such a big thing. If you haven't been to it, I'm not affiliated with the movie in any way. But I can tell you, fantastic. This is, I think, their fifth movie, this church. Uh, the Kendricks is a family that they, they're the ones that started it. Uh, hey, Edward, good to see you, man. Um, and uh, uh, this, was, this was fantastic. And here's my thing. I have many friends uh, who are in the movie business, who are actors, producers, directors, all of that. And uh, one of the things, and they're believers, are, they're, they're uh, conservative and they're believers. And one of the things they always talk about is, look, if we could get the money, if we could get the money, to produce these movies on a regular basis, we would flood Hollywood with these movies. Because you know what? Here's the crazy thing. They make money. Family movies make money. And so it, it, we, could, we could close off the space, the marketplace. We could fill it up with great movies with a great purpose and a great message. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of support to do it. And if you stayed, I stayed till the very end almost. I think did we stay the very end. Uh, of the movie and if you watch those credits my goodness there were about 60 babysitters weren't there yeah. they put the babysitters in there they put the people who you know looked after people's cars while they were there doing their part and it was amazing uh, what it takes to make a movie happen and an awful lot of money and I kept saying throughout the movie man I hope they're making millions of dollars because they deserve it what a movie what a powerful movie anyway that's all I have to say about that uh, Sue, thank you so much for joining us, and, and Miss Sonia, thank you for joining us. She's a great Bible teacher at Community Bible Study. Many of you know uh, Sonia, local local person here, and does great great work. So we we uh, we just we want to be intentional about what we do. 
We want to be people who, I, you know, I, I think about this a lot. And, and well, let me just give you a piece of advice. Uh, if you want angst, write a book. If you don't want angst, don't write a book. Um, it is really, really something. It's even the littlest thing can make such a big difference in the outcome of the book. And so, uh, you know, what you have to do, what you don't have to do. Hello to our speaker audience. I'm sorry I didn't even mention that. We've got the people on Facebook Live, but I failed to mention the folks uh, listening to us on the speaker. We really appreciate that. Hope the sound is good. Send me a message in chat if it's not, and I'll try to fix it. So in writing this book, uh, the Bible summary for real people, the uh is not in it. I just added that in for flair and marketing. The Bible study or the Bible summary for real people. I wrote this really, it was the 34th time I've read through the Bible and it may very well be the last with my health. But the fact of the matter of it is in reading through this time, so many more things. I was talking to Jerry about this today, weren't we sitting on the porch? which was a beautiful day to sit on a porch, wasn't it? Um, And so Jerry and I were sitting there, and Myra and all, and we were talking, and about reading the Bible, you can't help but to get something new, something something powerful every time you read it. Um, I I do want to say something really quick. Pay attention. Jill uh, brought to my attention uh, a a, a situation involving Drake Pardo. He's a four-year-old. And I've got, I have, ironically, I have some uh, very close affiliations with that case. And, uh, and, and what, ha- what has happened is Child Protective Services has come and gotten this child. He's an autistic child. Um, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye, but this is a case that you need to pray about. Uh, Dr. James Dobson, Family Talk, has talked about it on their podcast. Um, and you want to be aware of it, regardless of what the circumstances, the underlying circumstances are. The fact of the matter is, is there's a four-year-old who is autistic, has been displaced uh, from the home. It's very, very important that we pay attention to this, no matter how it turns out. That said, um, the lady, I happen to be very familiar with the lady who is now in charge of, of all of that, and I happen to make contact with some investigators who actually are on the case, as well as the lady who is involved in administrating the whole thing. And so you can rest assured the right thing is going to happen. The right people are involved, and, and so we want to, we just want to pray for that as well. That's a, that's a big thing. Anyhow, so writing the book, thank you for bringing that to my attention. In writing this book, um, when, I, when I came to the point of, I call it the point of understanding, where I read and then it's a natural stopping point, I have to just stop for a second and ponder what it is I've read. You know, you've got to ponder what you've read. You've got to stop periodically. It's not a stopwatch sort of thing. In the in the movie yesterday, the girl ran cross country, right? And you know, cross country running competitions, racing competitions, things of that nature. There's a clock, rightly so. But in this, there's not a clock. You you just read. Um, and I would encourage you. Some people say, well, every time I try to read the Bible, I fall asleep. And I say this, that's okay to a point. There's a lot of people that you know they will read the Bible and they'll fall asleep. My suggestion to you is don't read the Bible. When my book comes out, don't read it laying down. Don't read it laying down. Don't read the Bible laying down. Find yourself a comfortable position, but not too comfortable. And then when you read, stop before you get so sleepy that you can't take that moment and reflect and that moment and go, God, thank you for giving this to me. Thank you for all the people that bled and died to give us this great, great library of 66 books. uh, So contiguous from start to finish. And so we're so fortunate to have it. I, I feel honored every time uh, I, I touch the word. It's, it's, I just revere what went into that. That said, there's an important period of time, and this is for the folk, when the, when, when the book comes out, uh, I'll, I'll repeat this to some degree, but there's a period of time of understanding where things come to you. I encourage you, somebody said to me, I was in church, uh, a church uh, down in North Carolina, uh, last week or the week before, and somebody said to me, I, you're the first person I've seen in a long time bring an actual Bible to church, and you're the first person I've ever seen writing in your Bible. I've just not seen that. I've not seen anybody do it. And, and so I introduced myself, and they said, well, well at, you know, you've got a doctorate. In why, would you, why would you still write? I would imagine you'd know what you need to know by now. I said, oh, no, it's never. That's, I'm only getting started, you know. But I do that 
I do it because when I pass my Bibles on, whoever gets the Bibles, uh, there's going to be writing in just about every one of them. And some of the Bibles are written in from start to finish. And there's some funny stuff. And there's some, oh, wow, I did not know that. Even after all of the training and schooling and all that stuff, a preacher will preach something. It doesn't even have to be a preacher. It could be somebody. I've learned so much over the years from people that don't have a title before or after their name. And it's precious. It's, it's just precious to have that. And a lot of times I'll just try to write that in there. And the date and where I, who told me that. And then I check it. And sure enough, it's true. I don't know how I missed that. Because I, because I was in a hurry. I had, a, I had a, a start line and a finish line. Well, the finish line is heaven. The finish line is being in the presence of the king. So you don't need to worry about a finish line here on earth. But what you do need to do is give yourself time to just sit back and breathe in the word and that that moment or moments of understanding and let it come into you and let the holy spirit the ruach hakodesh let that let that breathe the supernatural word capital w into your soul and i'm telling you it'll make all the difference in the world so we're up to believe it or not hosea right and somebody said to me the other day said you know it's I, i'm sorry to tell you i don't think i'll like your book and i said oh well that, is it because i don't have pictures in the book and uh, But I think I'm going to have pictures. I think there are going to be some pictures in there. We have to talk about that. Do you know that color pictures, you know the biggest expense, this is free of charge, no cost of obligation to you. It's the biggest expense of a book, the publishing of a book, is not what's in between the front and back. It is the cover. Wow. The cover is where they put the money. Isn't that something? It's amazing to me. So, but if we can, hey, Blaine, thank you for joining us, and Clark and Christy and so many. And Joe, it's so great to have you. What a wonderful thing. So they said to me, they said, I don't think I'm going to read your book only because, you know, I just don't like the Old Testament. To me, it's weird. It's boring. It's irrelevant. All these things. And I said, you know, there, yeah, there's, there's, I mean, if they had guns, there'd be gunfights. But there was knife fights. There was sword fights. There was uh, staff fights. There was supernatural. I mean, it was wild. It's a wild, wild deal. And there's stuff that happens in there that you just won't believe it. But here's the thing. All of that stuff that happens is incredibly pertinent to the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament makes a far less sense to regular thinking people without the Old Testament. You think, where in the world did this come from? But what the Old Testament and understanding of the Old Testament also does is guess what it does? It gives you a contiguous line. To Christ, and even more than that, it gives you a contiguous line to the grace and mercy of the Master, of the shed blood and on the cross, and willingly so, and the empty grave. Praise God. Here's the thing: somebody said to me the other day this funny thing, and, and I've been told this before. They said, "Well, I don't even understand why we need the Old Testament. If the Lord, if, if Jesus would just come back and do some miracles, like obvious miracles, well, we believe." And I said this to them: I said, "You know, at the ascension." There were 500 people there, and of that 500, we're told by historians, only 125 were believers. They saw him ascend, perfected. Now listen, if you see that and you still can't be a believer, well, I just don't know what will help you. I don't know what kind of miracle will help you. Anyway, I'm fascinated by the Old Testament. I think it's fun. I'm also fascinated by the New Testament. I'm just fascinated. And the fact of the matter of it is, this, this library of books is powerful. And Hosea is powerful. It was, yeah, it's wild. It's wild what happens in this book. So the author was Hosea. Remember I tell you, we tell you who wrote it, when did they write it, the number of chapters, to whom was it written. Now Jerry and I were just having this conversation. Listen, not every book in the Bible was written to us. In fact, most of them weren't. Are they good for our edification to learn and, and all of those things? Absolutely. But you're going to learn today in a few short minutes, because this is short. Once I get going, it's good. It's, you're going to be like, he can't be finished. Sean's shaking his head. Angie's laughing questioningly. It will happen, believe it or not. It is funny. That was a joke I just told. No, no, no. It really will happen. So, But you're going to learn who the specific audiences of these books were and it was only written to these people. This was, there was a, a time, there was a thing that was happening that had to be dealt with in order for the kingdom to move forward, in order for all of the prophecy and all of the things that were foretold. It, it had to happen. Powerful, but these people had to hear this word. 
Jerry uses the saying, and I use the saying too, and I love it. Uh, you know, when we read the Old Testament, we're reading other people. When we read the Bible, we're reading other people's mail. And oh, is it powerful. So powerful. So Hosea has... Uh, it was written 715 to 755 B.C. Hosea, remember, was the author. Uh, the number of chapters is 14. 14 chapters. To whom was it written? Now, this is going to be interesting to you. The northern kingdom of Israel. Not just the kingdom of Israel, the people of Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel. And as I do the two other books that we're going to do today, you're going to learn how impressive that is and how specific that is and why it's so important. So the northern kingdom of Israel, the purpose of the writing, apostasy from God is spiritual adultery. Now you're going to see a lot of uh, idiomatic language. You're going to see a lot of you're going to see a lot of things that represent something else, right? Things that the general public in this place in this time, the people of this place in this time, the northern kingdom that they were dealing with it. And the powerful thing about God and the writing of His Word through His through the authors He chose and inspired is that he knew how to get the point across for those people. And sometimes he uses idiomatic language, which is any of you who have studied the Hebrew language, it's very idiomatic. He uses idioms to tell a story. Apostasy from God is spiritual adultery. Now, tragically, this is a story of great complexity told by a prophet who loved God. Hosea loved God. His heart was absolutely broken by a woman that God told Hosea would break his heart through it, and he, he said it. He specifically laid it out. He said, this woman's going to break your heart through infidelity. Don't mess around with her. Move on. She's going to break your heart. Hosea, you know, he had a heart for this woman, and he went on ahead anyway, and he got his heart broken really, really badly. Within the greatness of God, though, there are seeds of growth that are only germinated by our obedience. I, now, I'm going to say this. I've learned as much or more which I don't want to test this all the time, but I've learned as much or more from when I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do or I didn't obey or I didn't, I didn't do what God told me to do when I did it. I've learned. You know, we don't learn when we see the light sometimes. How many can agree with that? Sometimes we don't learn when we see the light. Sometimes we have to be burnt by the torch. That is the light. Sometimes we have to feel pain. I don't like it. None of us like it, but you know what? You'll never forget. When I was a police officer, I used to say, somebody would say, why are you running around giving me a, a ticket? I said, well, you were going 22 miles an hour over the speed limit. That's why I gave you a ticket. Well, I also gave you a ticket so that it would remind you of, of the preciousness of life. And they'd say, well, you just could have told me that. And I said, you know, I see you were stopped nine times over the course of the last year. Yeah, we actually have a record of that. And guess what? I'm the first one to give you a ticket. I'm hoping I can turn it around that you'll remember and that you won't have an 11th time. I'm hoping that this pain of paying, I value your money just like you do. I value my money. I don't want to have to pay money for a ticket, but sometimes we don't learn without pain so god instructed hosea to go retrieve his wayward wife who was delivered into slavery by her sin and redeemed by the forgiveness of her godly husband how difficult must it have been for hosea to obey god in this instance now let's think about this she has gone she is gone she has stepped out on him she said i'm out you're boring this other fellow's not as boring as you it's flashy i'm going with him he can offer me more than you Guess what happened to her? She got delivered into slavery. She got delivered. She was put into bondage by by how she was living and behaving. And so, but her husband went and got her despite her sin. He went, can you imagine being told that? Go get her. Go get her. She's your wife. Go get her. But he had to forgive her. The part of go getting was not to go get and say, hey, listen, woman, grabbing her by the hair you're my woman i'm grabbing you back nope forgiveness was a huge part of it despite her betrayal israel would be enslaved due to her disobedience and god would mercifully come after his disobedient people now i'm not talking about hosea's uh wife i'm talking about israel her referred as her so disobedient but let's not be so hard on and i talk about this in the book in greater detail listen it was a hard time it was crazy times if you, if you research uh, uh, he, Hebrew history, Jewish history, Israeli history, you realize, man, they've been through some tough stuff. There's been some crazy stuff going on, and they've had to fight a lot of challenges. And the people, as the coming together of the tribes, remember they were separate and distinct, and then they're coming together. I've talked about that in other messages. 
man, oh man, oh man, for them to come together, it needed, there's something that needed to happen. There needed to be a catalyst. There needed to be several catalysts for them to come, to ha- come together and be a contiguous church, if you will. Here's the thing. Redemption is an amazing concept. Oh, my goodness. The movie talked about it yesterday. The, the, was it yesterday we went to see that? The movie was so powerful, and the message was redemption. The, I don't want to tell you the story. I was going to tell you the story. I'm not going to tell you the story. Anyway, the point is it's a great story. You should go see it. But take you some good tissues. That said, the story really is about redemption. The story is about forgiveness and grace and mercy that's so much bigger than any of us can imagine. You know, we measure our grace and mercy, grace and mercy, by what we're capable of. We say, God, you're only capable of this. We recreate him in our own image. And we're just simply wrong to do so. It's so easy to do it, though. We can refer to the things that we know. We can refer to the things that we know, and we can associate and apply those things we know to other people. But how many of you have known a person that has such limitless grace, limitless forgiveness, limitless, just amazing, and you meet them and you say, wow, how am I ever going to be like that? Right? We buried my last uncle, my Uncle Orv. Uncle Orville was an amazing man. He was a man of quiet, reserved class. And you know what? When he was laying in the casket, I looked at him and I said, that's just exactly how he was. Right there, just quiet. He would often have his, remember? He'd have his hands together. He'd always be dressed, always dressed to the nines. Yeah, he'd do this a lot. He was, oh my goodness, Uncle Orville was something special. And so Uncle Orville, he, he just was the neatest guy ever. I'll just tell you this really quick. This is, has nothing to do, well, maybe it does. You be going there, and I call him up, right? Remember, we call him up. We say, hey, listen, we found that we can kind of change our route a little bit, swing by and see you and Aunt Jean, and, and maybe if I'm lucky, Cousin Dave, my favorite. And uh, if you knew Dave, you'd know why he's my favorite. Anyhow, we come by there and see you. But listen, we don't need anything to eat. We don't need anything to eat. Just, just, we just want to see you. We've only come for 10 minutes. Well, you know, you got to be hungry. No, 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 we're not hungry. We're good. We're good. We just got to be somewhere, and it's no problem. We'll just, we'll just pop in for 10 minutes. Well, then we get there, and Uncle Orville's not there. Well, Uncle Orville absconded in his car and drove to the hoagie shop and the chips place and got a hoagie big as your arm and comes back, and he's got every kind of chip and soda and all this stuff. I say, Where is, where's Uncle Orville? Oh, he's out running errands. Oh, okay. And here he comes in the door of big bags. And then we sit there and three and a half, four hours later with a uh, stuffed belly and face that hurts from laughing because, let's face it, Aunt Jean, she was funny. She preceded him in death earlier this year. And But Uncle Orv is there now. He's there in heaven. He's received his reward. But, you know, there was a time in Uncle Orville's life where he had to be very forgiving. He had to be very forgiving of Aunt Jean. And let me tell you something. It was humbling. It was humbling to see. It was a little bit heartbreaking because I loved them both. But I'm telling you, that reminded me of Christ. It reminded me of the forgiveness, the patience, the redemption, the grace and mercy of God. That's what we're supposed to be, right? We're supposed to reflect that. How interesting is it that a a, a cute little old man could render that and give an example? It's not always that way, is it? We see a lot of times where we don't represent that we don't represent the grace and mercy and the redemption of of an holy god the holy god the awesome god we don't do that why because we say "Mm, i'm not doing that listen you can forgive him if you want to you can forgive her if you want to but i'm not going to i'm not going to forget i can tell you that right now because we're we're modeling the natural but there are people here on this planet that that model the father just absolutely amazing so, so Israel, due to their disobedience, they were enslaved. They were, they, they were just plain and simple disobedient. And you wouldn't think that God would redeem them. You just wouldn't think he would do it, but he did it. He did it over and over and over. And that's a, a model for us because you say, well, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have forgiven him. How would you like for God to go, oh, I remember that Sean Greener saying that time. He wouldn't have forgiven the Israelites, so maybe I just won't forgive him now that I think about it. I mean, I'm just using Sean Greener's own words. Why not? 
his own behavior, his own actions. So we New Testament Christians, that's the postmodern Western evangelical Christians, we seem to believe that we're somehow relieved of the sin of spiritual adultery. Yet we sell out our faith and our witness daily by muting our testimony of Christ, by hiding out faith, hiding our faith from the eyes of those around us. Why? We say, hey, I don't, I don't discuss religion. There's religion and politics. I don't talk about it. Oh, if you want to stay friends, you want to have good family, you don't talk about it. That's not true. That's foolhardy. It's just stupid. And you're being a chump. I, I picked that word just out of the blue. I don't bring that back. Chump is a word that's no longer, people don't ever talk about it. But I'm going to bring it back. I like it. Chump. <laughs> Spread that. You don't even have to hashtag it. So here's the, here's the thing. We hide out. We hide our faith. We hide who we are. We, we hide what drives us. We hide all of those things. Why do we do it? Because we don't want to be, we don't want to be, really, to, to a great degree, we don't want to be set apart. We don't want to be viewed separately, right? The worst thing you can do to a teenage girl or boy is what? Put them out in front. Shine a highlight on them. Make them stand out. Make them not like everybody else. Make them unique and different. I think it's so... I can't say it because I'll ruin the movie for you. I'm telling you, you got to go see this movie. There is a part in this movie where the, the person about whom this movie is really centered uh, it does something that will rock your socks. I get teary-eyed just thinking about it. Man. Mm, mm, mm. got to go see that movie. I'm telling you right now. We mute. It's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever watch. And hear. It's just amazing. It's so beautiful. We sell out our own faith, right? We minimize our own faith by being afraid to be who we are. There's a part of the movie, I can tell you this because I talk about it all the time. It's not original. Who are you? Who are you? Well, I'm a this, I'm a that. We name off the things that we would list on a sort of a resume. No, no, no. I, I want to know who are you? Who are you? And, 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 and the number of things that you list, where do you rank? I'm a follower of the way. I'm a believer. How long do you wait when you meet somebody? Maybe somebody you work with. Maybe your neighbor. Maybe a friend of some sort before you tell them, this is who I am. This is what I believe. My faith is who I am. How long? How far down the list? How many days? How many weeks? How many years is it before they learn? you're a person of faith, a follower of the way. As Israel paid a great price, so will we. Hosea used the most figurative, idiomatic language to illustrate important concepts, concepts, and I just love it. The valley of Accor for a door of hope. It's found in Hosea 2.15, but you can also find it contiguously in Joshua 7, 24-26. Joined to idols, that's Hosea 4.17. Mixes with the nations. That means no longer a separated and holy nation. That Hosea 7, 8 talks about that. I love this one. A cake not turned, which is dough on one side, expressing half-heartedness. That's Hosea 7, 8 as well. Strangers devour, devour his strength. means weakened by evil associations. Hosea 7, 9. Gray hairs are also sprinkled on him, which means premature old age and unconscious Deterioration. That's Hosea 7 as well. Israel swallowed up. Their national identity was lost. Hosea 8.8. 8. A vessel in which no one delights. That's a marred and useless vessel to the Lord. Fa false balances. That means commercial trickery in business. Let me tell you something. If you're a business person, if you're a person that works, you run a charity or you're a business person, whatever, whatever you're your industry is, whatever your thing that you do to, to provide revenue for your family and feed your family, whatever it is, if you're a person of faith, whether you keep it quiet or not, you better be completely above board. I mean 100%. Go overboard to be trustworthy. Go overboard to be, if you're a charity, go overboard to demonstrate that you're an honest charity. If you are a business person, go overboard. I, I was reading this, this uh this weekend about all of the, the construction businesses who have been, there's people going to jail. There's one guy going to jail for 22 years for fraud, taking people's money, 22 years. And allegedly, 
he was a Christian. Given the previous nine instances of imagery addressing real-world challenges, one cannot deny the relevance of God's word to modern challenges. Listen, this wasn't written to us, but we can learn something from it, can't we? It's absolutely powerful to me. Um, But let's go on to the book of Joel. You're going to like this one. Joel, which means in Hebrew, Yehovah is God. Yehovah is God. The date of writing, we don't know. Listen, let's call it what it is. Let's not guess. Let's just say, you know what? I don't know. I don't know when it was written. The number of chapters is only three. Three chapters. Easy to get through. Easy to do. The, this blows my mind. Remember, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was Hosea, and now this was written to the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom of Judah. The purpose of the writing, Joel serves as a warning to the people of Judah of God's impending judgment because of their sins. He was the guy. He's responsible to warn these people of Judah of God's impending judgment. He's saying, better pay attention. Listen, we make fun of the guy in the sandwich board sign that says repent on the front, repent on the back, and he's ringing a bell. Repent, repent. I remember the first time I was in New York City, I saw a guy. I saw this guy, and he was walking. And, you know, it put me off a little bit. It put me off a little bit. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. that dude might be a little bit crazy. But then I think about Lazarus. There's one coming greater than me. There's one coming greater than me. I'm not even fit to tie his shoes, let alone baptize him. But prophecy said you would be the one. Prophecy, he leapt in the womb when they were together. He knew he was Hamashiach. He knew he was the Christ. He knew he was the Savior of all nations in all time. He knew it. And one day he would have his head removed from his body because of it prices to pay i talked a few minutes ago about embarrassment being being standing out being put in front of somebody that's the thing we fear the most we don't want to be singled out but the bible says we're to be sanctified and set apart we're to be set apart holy ones holy ones amazing to me absolutely amazing to me and joel is the guy Joel is the guy. That's his job, man. That's what he's got to do. He's got to warn these people. None of us want to be that person, do we? Right? We don't want to be that person. Unpopular. It's unpopular. It's the most unpopular job you can ever imagine. Nobody wants to hear those warnings. Here's the thing. As in Daniel 9, a pleading prayer was offered to God. Remember, we talked about that. That prayer was amazing and powerful. Remember what we said about Daniel. Remember the lion's den. How old was he when he was in the lion's den? He was in his 80s. He wasn't a little kid with childish faith. He was an old man, and yet he was in the lion's den. And he was comfortable, and he was calm. But, but as in Daniel 9, a pleading prayer was offered to God for his, for, the, for his disobedient people by the prophet Joel. He offered soul-deep pleading for the change in Judah. Soul-deep. Right? I had to write this thing. I had to write this saying for one of my classes for Dr. Moen. You guys know Dr. Moen. You also know he's probably the hardest teacher, one of the hardest teachers I've ever had, the hardest professor I've ever had. And he had this project where you had to write sort of your mission statement. And I wrote my mission statement. It kept coming back and coming back and coming back. Then it got referred to another professor. It was like, good lands. I've worn out Dr. Moen. Now they're switching me. Uh, but it, what it was is they wanted a fresh perspective. And understand, then I came to the point where it, this soul-deep knowledge of, of God. That's what I wanted. They said, what do you want? What do you want from your faith? And I, and I finally narrowed it down, a soul-deep knowledge of God. Well, here's the thing. Joel, his pleading, and I don't know about you, but, I, I, you, know, uh, well, you know, you guys almost had a crash here involving a motorcycle on the way here. And, that, and, and somehow God puts you in the exact right place and, 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 and Steve held the car in the exact right place. And this motorcyclist bounced off of their car and ended up straight up and down. He was surely going to crash. And here he is, straight up, and he's fine now. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But if you were going to pray for that person in advance, if God said, hey, this is going to happen to this fellow, I need you to pray for this person. Lord, just bless this person. Maybe be fine and all of it will be good. Amen. Right? Is that the prayer you're going to pray? What if that's your brother? What if that's your son? What if that's your husband? What if that's your women ride motorcycles? What if that's your wife, your daughter, your mother even? How do you pray for people that you love so much? You plead. You know somebody's in trouble. I have a dear friend, uh, Mr. Algeo is, is listening. 
thank you so much. I'm honored to have you and Terry and, and Jamie and Bill and Brant and Drew. Um, but Mr. Algea knows what it's like to lose a daughter. Katrina did my teeth after my crash. She was amazing. Look, she did a good job. And I'm telling you, I saw this child every six weeks for three years. I got my braces off on a Friday and Sunday. She was, she was gone. It wrecked my soul. I am telling you, didn't it? I, I didn't know which end was up. And I thought to myself, I knew something was wrong. And I asked her, I said, honey, what's wrong? Something's wrong. You got a coat on. It's not cold in here. You're, you're make, you never make mistakes. You've been making mistakes the last few, two, few times I was here. What's going on? Are you okay? What's up? And I remember not believing her answer. I didn't believe her answer. But you know what? I was invested too shallow. I thought about saying, come on, let's come over here and talk. And I did kind of try to do that. I said, you have a minute? Maybe we could get something to eat or something. You have a break or something like that? And I was going to talk to her more. She goes, no, no, no. I have to work through my break because I've been sick. I've had this cold and blah, blah, blah. And she just relapsed. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. I knew something was wrong. I never thought it was what it ended up being. Never. That hit me like a plank in the face. But if I'd have been more invested, if I'd have said, honey, come on now, let's find a way. How about after work? What time do you finish? Well, I have school. Hey, you know what? Skip a little bit of school. Something's wrong, and I know it, and I want to help you with it. How do we pray for people like that, that we love, that we care for? Do we really genuinely pray? I, I, there's somebody listening now. Her husband prays, goes into a closet, locks himself into a small room, and he prays for two hours every single day. And he prays not just for himself and understanding, deep understanding, soul deep understanding of the word, but he prays for people as they say, and he writes it down, and he says, you know, okay, this so-and-so, I'm going to pray for so-and-so about this. And then he prays. I, I, I went to this, this uh, event in Millington, was it Millington? No, 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 it was in uh, Newark, Delaware, actually, decades ago. And this old man and his wife travel around the country doing workshops on prayer. Little old man. He was just a little old thing. And let me tell you what, though, he was fire. He was fire when he started preaching. He looked around that room that would hold 2,000 people almost, and he said, why are there only a few hundred people talking about prayer? What it can mean, how it can change history. It can change the direction of a person. I thought to myself, I prayed a quick little prayer for her. I said, please help Katrina. Father, help her. Whatever is wrong, help her. Help her to feel better. If she's truly indeed just sick, then help her to feel better. And that Sunday, I got the call nobody ever wants to get. God bless them. Such a hard thing. You would might call that a plague of locusts on your family. You know, most people nowadays, they don't know what locusts are, right? Because we don't live on the plains as much. It's a very urban society. So, and suburban society, don't see a lot of those. But I'm going to tell you something. This plague of locusts was sent by God to discipline his disobedient people. And it devastated the foliage. And in an, an agricultural or an agrarian society, foliage and plants and all of that is everything. And in Judah, this is what happened. God issued this discipline and a severe drought as a direct result of the sins of the people. Just like in Daniel 9, Joel rings the clarion for national repentance. But you know what? It, it went unheeded. God does this with, with us, doesn't he? Sometimes he says, hey, hey, let me get your attention here. Sometimes he sends somebody in our path and says, let me get your attention. Hey, you're not listening to me. You need to listen. This is serious. Sometimes he calls you to be the clarion in someone else's life. Man, that's difficult, right? It's difficult. Even though we don't put on uh, animal skins and eat locusts and wild honey like Lazarus, you know what? It's difficult to put on that responsibility that God has given us. Now, that doesn't mean you run around and tell everybody. That's right. Uh, Miss Nancy, who was, who was a prophet literally in my life, uh, so prophetic. Apostolic prayers are powerful. Second Thessalonians three three and James four seven. Write those down. You know if she's telling you it means something. Second Thessalonians three three and James four seven. So here's the thing. Here's the crazy crazy thing. Sometimes when you are called by God to be that person to ring the bell to another person, sometimes some people take that a little too eagerly, don't they? You know people. We were talking about how we came up in uh, Jerry and Myra. You know, there's, but hey, listen, I've been in churches. There's, 
there's plenty of folks that they hear bells in their head and that's God saying they think it's God saying tell everybody else what they're doing wrong but that's that's not we're talking about something a soul deep prayer for somebody we're talking about humbly approaching somebody that you know is about to crash and burn and warning them and helping them and saying how can I help you I want to help you through this I would to God that I had that conversation with Katrina one more time I would to God I would have gone right to my friend the doctor that owns the practice I would have gone right to him and I would say buddy there's a problem here I don't get anybody in trouble I want to help them something very serious is wrong let's work together to do it let's let's team up I didn't do it I didn't do it he and I have had lunch many times together been together lots of times and and he shakes his head too how could I not see it how did I not see it that's how we are we get busy in life God told Joel stop everything stop everything God told Hosea stop everything you're going to be unpopular for what I'm telling you to do but stop everything stop worrying about how popular you're going to be there's a nation that needs warning you know uh, there's this thing I saw on the way over here I was trying to rest my eyes a little bit but I happened to pop on I thought I forgot to do something I said oh man I gotta go in here and there was somebody sent me this picture of this doll that helps people that have had abortions to celebrate their abortions what? yeah believe it or not it's a doll it's a doll can you can you believe that it's a doll and they said it celebrates your abortion and you should you should and there's a matching t-shirt and all this stuff many of you probably have seen it it's unbelievable unbelievable to me celebrate your abortion you wouldn't believe the person who is pushing this a major star a major celebrity that, that uh, just about everybody knows listen here's the thing here's the thing we're talking about a national repentance here that's being called for but you know what all of us have our hurts habits and hang-ups i do i have mine i've talked to you about them before i'm telling you it's we all got it it's hard it's a hard way to go life is challenging there's many temptations but the fact of the matter of it is a promise of deliverance was made conditional upon the people of Judah turning from their sins. If you turn from your sins, and, and everybody quotes this verse. You, you, I know you've heard it. Joel 2.25. This is the NASB. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The creeping locust, the striping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. He said, I sent this to you for you to learn. I'm, I put this calamity on you for you to learn. I did this for you. I know it doesn't seem like it. Controlled pain versus out of control pain. Regulated pain versus unregulated pain. Pain that comes from someone who loves you. Someone that stands in front of you and says, don't do this. You're going the wrong direction. Put that thing down. Walk away. My great army, which I sent among you. He gave him the warning, but then he said, I will make up to you for the years that the locust has eaten. We're taught an underlying lesson here in this passage. God can, and he will use all of this world, including insects. I know, you wish you'd stop using insects. Yeah, let me ask you this. This is just for free. Any of you ever, you're laying down, you're reaching for your light, you're reaching for your light, and you look up in the corner, and it's over there, and you see a spider on the wall, but you still turn off the light, and you're like, mm, I better not turn off that light. Let me go get that spider. You turn the light back on, and it's gone. There's the funniest video. I hope you're not going to be mad at me, Bonnie. I'm not going to show the video. I'll let you show it, put it in comments. If, well, you better not put that one in the comments or mute the sound or something. Put music over it. Let me tell you something. This funniest thing. They live in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and tarantulas. I said it. She comes out of her door, and there's a tarantula by the door, and there's a tarantula over here. And I wonder if that tarantula is related to this tarantula. I wonder if that's a family and all this stuff. You think it's the same one. I don't know. And uh, Bonnie and I do photography together. And what's funny is there is a video that uh, Sweet Sweet Katie and PJ, they leave the door open for Scout, PJ and Katie's dog, to come back and forth, which we love Scout. Scout's wonderful. We love that dog. But Scout came running in one day. Now, Scout's a dog dog. Like, he's not one of these little pocket dogs. He's a real dog. He's big. Yeah, he's not one of those little, you know, 
teacup deals, he's, you know, I mean, he's big dog. And he looks fearsome, but he's sweet as can be. He comes running in. And what comes after him? A tarantula running. You can put in comments, Bonnie, if this is not true. But uh, PJ had to go all Wayne Gretzky on this, on this tarantula. I kid you not. I kid you not. And he even said, Wayne Gretzky slaps up. And said to smack the thing out. And then he closes the door behind him. I mean, right? What if God set a bunch of tarantulas? Boy, we'd get the picture quicker, wouldn't we? God has sovereignty over all of creation. It's his creation. He made it. God has sovereignty over the whole thing. He is sovereign. We forget that. We forget that. Listen, Dorian, uh, to a great degree, scares me for the damage it it could do to so many people. Uh, Listen, I'm down in North Carolina all the time, and I can tell you something. There's still 20,000 people out of their homes. I know people personally who have lost their homes. They've lost them. No insurance. They had insurance. They thought was the right insurance. The doctor that's working on me, his, his beautiful building, water poured into the building. Well, it's not covered. Why isn't it covered? He said, because it was a wind-driven rain, not just a rain. It was a wind-driven rain. i got to be kidding me. Two years later, they still they won't fix the roof. We don't hear about this, but for years we've heard about people living in here. Right. Yeah, we don't hear anything about this. That is something. I was just talking to Jerry and Myron and Colleen about that. Is we don't you know you don't hear about the people in the Midwest that had that flooding and lost everything. Family farms, hundreds of years gone. They can never grow another thing. Unbelievable. But we hear about mm, we hear about we hear about uh, Katrina still today. Anyway, that's a whole other deal. This makes me mad. But the bottom line is, is here they are arguing about it. They can't figure out, come on now, fix this thing. There are people that I know personally, dear, sweet people, and guess what? They lost their home. They had insurance. Many of them had flood insurance, and they lost their home. I have a friend down there who they were told emphatically, you don't need flood insurance. You know we're even near a flood zone. It's not flooded here in hundreds of years. You don't need flood insurance. Meanwhile, 12 feet of water overtook their home along with their neighbors, and they lost everything. Not a dime. And guess what? That payment is still due to the bank. Lots of people. I know that God has power. He has sovereignty. He is sovereign over the weather. He can stop any wave. He can stop any storm. And we plead with him to do that. But we know this is a broken world. We, we didn't listen, did we? I'm not saying this is punishment for anything we did. I don't know. But let me tell you something. Abortion? Yeah. Abortion? You're killing the most precious and innocent in the world, in the whole galaxy of galaxies. And we're not going to get away with that. I'm telling you, we are not going to get... Isn't it interesting that a Donald Trump, who we say is a, 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 the least Christ-like, is the guy fighting... For the innocent and unborn. Boy, if that isn't something. A David in our generation. That being said, thank you to all of you who are are joining. Thank you so much for joining. It means a lot to me. So Joel 2, 28 through 32. This is also the NASB. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. I'm here to tell you there's many benefits to obedience to God, not the least of which is an escape of punishment. We may suffer here. Not. Listen, if he calls you to be the bell and you step in front of somebody and say, hey, man, I love you. I got to talk to you about something. The long sleeves. What's the deal? It's warm in here. Your face is sunken. You don't look the same. She was a beautiful, beautiful girl silky blonde hair glistening skin she had the 
biggest, most beautiful smile. I was her favorite patient. Ask anybody. Well, not just me. Ask anybody. They'll tell you. They will tell you. Well, I was her favorite patient. They even said so. When I spoke at her funeral. I looked around. So many other faces sunken just like hers. So many eyes just like hers. And I said, there are those among you who are fighting this same demon. And you're going to end up just like that. If you don't turn it around. If you don't stop right here and now. I'm telling you, get help. If you need help and don't know where to go to get it, here's my phone number. And I literally gave a whole bunch of addicts my phone number. And I said, call me. And they did, didn't they? Sometimes at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And they were, they were so, so jacked up. And some of them have passed. And some of them have kicked the habit. And they're, they're, they're drug-free. And their whole life has changed. You look at pictures of them here. And you look at pictures of them now. And you say, that's not even the same person. But many of them we lost. Katrina. I thought she'd be my friend for the rest of my life. I would make up excuses to go in there, I'm sure. You know, oh, I need to get this, this retainer thing. i got to get it checked. You better, you better fix me up. Better check it, man. I think it's loose. And yet, she's gone. Listen, there's, there's many benefits. There's many benefits to obedience to God. And we know that escape of punishment in the eternal is a real thing. We may suffer embarrassment. We may suffer some pain here on earth. But God, just like with the locusts, he will return to us what the locusts have eaten. As we see in the above passage, the, the other benefit of obedience is the revelation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Man, you cannot put a price on that. Remember what I said, that moment of understanding. When you're reading your scripture, if you don't have a Bible, if you're listening, by the way, if you're listening and you can't afford a Bible or you're somewhere where you can't get a Bible, if we can get a Bible to Aleppo, Syria, we can get a Bible to you. You just let us know. We'll pay for it. You don't have to pay a dime. We will send it to you, and it'll be a good Bible. The, re- the revelation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it amplifies everything. It amplifies the learned assertion that without obedience, there can be no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If we're constantly fighting God, he will be mute. Without the Holy Spirit of the living God, no people, no matter how chosen they are, They won't prosper. They will not. And yet we know if the people are obedient and they follow hard after God, no weapon could be formed against them. The indwelling only comes to the obedient believer. Now here's my last one. Not forever, I hope, but for tonight. Book of the Bible, Amos. Love it. Love it. It's a simple, simple, very short book, nine chapters. Written 755 to 750 B.C. Amos wrote it. I love the name. If I was born in the in the uh, West, you know, I would he'd call me Amos. Even if my name wasn't Amos, I just like that name. Or Biff. I thought if I was. Don't you wish you? I mean, that's kind of a cool name. It seems preppy. Well, but look what I got on here. I'm okay with that. Biff. I like it. Biff. Stick with Amos. Or Amos. I'll take Amos. So who was this written? This was written to the Northern Kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. The purpose of the writing was to pronounce God's just judgment on his sinful people. Here we go. This will be short and sweet. Amos is unique because he was poor. He was a poor herdsman. He had nothing. He was a poor shepherd. Who else we know was a poor shepherd? Did great things for God. David. However, he traveled to wherever the rich spent their leisure time to tell them of their iniquities and the price to be paid for the disobedience of God. He didn't go to them because they were rich only. He went to them because their iniquities were great and they were rich. And other people were afraid to tell the rich in this time what they were doing wrong because the rich had power. The rich had power. He went there and he told them. He said, listen, you're going to pay. I better hurry up. What is it? I'm two minutes. I got two minutes. I don't really have two minutes, but I said it would be fast, so it's going to be fast. This last part, I promise you, will be. Amos spoke mostly against the social and economic sins of Israel. This is in my book, The Bible Summary for Real People. Sins of Israel, while he, a poor man, caring for a poor man's fruit, was answering the call of God without question. Listen, he didn't, he didn't ask God. God said, jump. He asked how high on the way up. How many of us will be that obedient? 
Some of you will get that in a second. That's a joke grenade. We understand clearly from Amos's ministry that caring for the poor and disadvantaged is an important mission of Christ followers, far more so important than to build an expansive church, these giant mega-million-dollar buildings, softball and basketball fields that, that rival uh, colleges, and all these leagues and these afternoon tea clubs and all this stuff and call themselves a church. Listen, I'm not talking bad about using them as a ministry to people who otherwise would not hear about Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't in any way belittle or bemoan a church that uses entertainment. I, you've all heard the story of when I went and Mr. Jewel Martin, it was an Easter Sunday. I was in the Navy. I was a young sailor in the Navy. I woke up and said, what in the world takes me not being in church on Easter Sunday? I figured out because I was up for days and I figured, oh, man, this is Easter. Why am I not going to church? And then I quickly put that out of my head and schlepped over to the, to the chow hall. I wanted to get the Marine Corps breakfast because they know how to make breakfast. And, uh, and there he was, all the way across the parking lot with the ugliest blue and white hand-painted bus you ever saw in your life, going like this, tall than me, little tiny man. I said, well, I, 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 go, I got to go in here and eat. I got to go in here. I, I got to eat. He goes, you can go and eat real fast. I'll be here for a little bit more. You get your breakfast. And then and I said, well, well but yeah, but yeah but I can get breakfast. But then if I go to your church, I'm going to come back and I'll miss lunch. I'll be super hungry. Look at me. I need my food. <laughs> he said, no problem. We have a home-cooked meal for you. The ladies in the church, some of them are old people. You know how old southern ladies do. They'll make the best food you ever ate in your life. And all you can eat. Well, that perked my ears up. I'm gonna be honest with you. All you can eat part perked my ears up, and then and then southern and then biscuits and then gravy and a lot of other stuff. It was said that you know, I, I heard that, and then and then I said, well, yeah, but then then I'll miss this and I'll miss that and all this and I I gotta do PT. I gotta exercise, personal tra physical training. I I gotta exercise and I can't miss that. You know, I got responsibilities. He says, no problem. We have a beautiful gym. We play basketball, all that stuff. Man, we've got it's awesome. It's awesome. Why don't you come? There's other sailors and Marines that come. There's kids from the church. He said, there's girls. <laughs> Southern girls from the church. They'd be in there. Perked my ears up a little bit there. I was just a young sailor. And I was like, oh, all right. And I went, and it was awesome. Let me tell you something. I don't know what would have happened to me had I said no. I don't, I don't know what would have happened to me. I don't know what was after that point had I not said, you know what, I'll go. I had a grand time. I ended up going to that church and then ended up teaching Sunday school and all this stuff while I was there. It was a turning point for my life. I'm going to tell you something. Basketball courts and, and dining halls and all those things can be used to the glory of God. It can be used to redeem souls from the lostness of the world. Where better to get a good home-cooked meal than in a church? Let me tell you, I, I, and I talk about this in my first book, Excellence Kill the Church, How Mediocrity is Destroying America. I talk about it in this book, The Bible, the Bible Summary for Real People. And I'm going to tell you, I mean it in both cases, and I mean it now. When I, when I say this about the buildings, in the town where I live, there are three or four churches spending separately millions of dollars, and they aren't even five miles apart. Millions of dollars on separate buildings, and essentially they are the same denomination. And it makes no sense to me at all. I'm not saying they can't feed people, but let me just say this. Today, the great churches need to be aware of the motivation to provide new programs that do not address the social and spiritual needs of their communities while they do provide recreation for those already blessed. What I mean by that is, is listen, if it's a country club and you can boast and say, you know, where you're going to really meet the powerful people, where you can really network, our church, we got all this stuff. And you can use it anytime you want. I'm talking about this, the spiritual needs 
of people who need to be in a gathering of, of believers who will feed them by mouth and by soul. Amos knew then what we should know now, that we don't need another church basketball league while hundreds of children in a five-mile radius from their church have no winter coat in the bitter cold. Amos was very clear to the people of his time, and following that judgment, he said, this is coming, and it's a judgment of fire upon a sinful people. Don't be a sinful people. Even people of faith can be sinful people. We in America today could well heed that same warning. Many of the people in our country have many opulent homes, while many of the poor have no place to call home. Listen, I'm, I'm the last person in the world would uh, call for open borders. I'm not calling for that at all. If you're a country, you need to have borders. If you don't have borders and walls and sovereignty, you don't have a country. This is not a call for socialism. Rather, this is a call for the church to meet the real needs of the people in their orbit, in their communities, including their spiritual needs, especially their spiritual needs. Let me say this. If only 30% Gout study and a Barna study concluded, if only 30% of, of the churches and 30% of the professing believers in the churches over the age of 18, only 30% of the churches and 30% of the professing believers that are over 18 gave this blow, this will blow your mind only $20 a week 20 bucks a week in the offering plate we would solve not just hunger in this country we would solve world hunger can you imagine Exponentially, the power of that. Materialism, listen, materialism isn't a new sin. Amos called us out in 755 B.C., and you know what? We still haven't learned. I want to say this to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. My name is Dr. Sean Michael Greener, and today is a great day to be alive. Thank you for joining Dr. Sean today. Please follow Dr. Sean at www.drseangreener.com and on social media at facebook.com forward slash smgreener, Twitter at The Ninja Pastor, and on Instagram at The Ninja Pastor. If you would like to support Dr. Sean's ministry and send Bibles around the world, don't forget to hit the donate page on drseangreener.com. Or go to paypal.me forward slash Dr. Sean Greener to invest in spreading the word of God to the world.